I wanted to talk about the Declaration of Independence because today is July 4th and what that document actually means. Um, I'm sorry, as you can tell, I'm in my study and the, my laptop, I, I came running in, so my laptop is very precariously balanced. And if you, in fact, have a, a, a Declaration of Independence in front of you um, or call one up, you might find it useful so that we could actually talk about the text. But let me start here by reminding you that it was actually on July 2nd that the Second Continental Congress agreed to the resolution that said uh, that it was that the the United Colonies were considered themselves independent of Great Britain. And the story behind that matters a bit because if you remember, and I wrote about this the other day, if you didn't see it, I think it was July 2nd I wrote about this. What happens is that um, the the colonists, the Euro-American colonists, in the 13 colonies that are going to become the United States have been developing a set of grievances against the king's ministers, not really so much against the king, but against the king's ministers um, from 1763 forward. And those sort of snowball really quickly, but, but it's really important that until 1776, they don't ever hold anything against the king. They keep trying to say, oh, it's just your ministers. You know, we're kind, we're cool with you. We're loyal subjects. You know, we we don't want to be independent. And there's a number of reasons that they don't want to be independent. It's not just that they're afraid of the British Army and Navy, which is so enormously powerful, but also because the colonies themselves are bitterly divided. They have tons of religions, tons of people, tons of languages. And there are a number of uh, colonists who don't believe that they can ever find any common ground amongst themselves and they need that hand of the king. So they won't push back against the king himself. They keep saying, oh, you know, we don't like what you're doing, but it's parliament. We don't like what you're doing, it's your ministers. So this is why Thomas Paine's common sense is so important. It comes out in January of 1776 and it's, he's a recent immigrant to the United States, or there, I'm sorry, the colonies, and it's a really good read. Just so you know, I used to teach it and I would always, every year I would pick it up and I would think, why did I teach this? It's so dry. And then I would read to like page three and I'm like, oh my God, this is great. It's a great read. It's told very simply. He's using language that is very accessible even today compared to what his, um, compared to what his, uh, uh, contemporaries were using. And he says, listen, this is not um, a fight with the king's ministers. This is a fight about the rights of people and the rights of people to maintain their own government. And he says it's he, he's got a great advantage to, to many people um, who are going to be advocating the same kinds of language in other countries. He says, you know, England's a continent. England's an island. Why on earth should it rule over a continent? That's just stupid. And then he goes on to outline how one creates a government and how, in fact, we shouldn't have kings, that there shouldn't be such a thing as a king because it's entirely arbitrary. And this is where he has that great line about who's king in America. The law is king in America. And he goes on to call people to the idea of independence by saying, you know, we uh, we are in this moment right now when we can make the world over again. That's a, it's a line I quoted the other night, you know, and don't be weenies. He, that's my word, not his. You know, now is our moment. Now, now is the time when we need to step forward and grab this with both hands. And he writes this and he writes it in such a way that people really can get it. They really understand it. And very quickly, they start talking with each other about, about independence and about declaring independence. So um, one of the things I'm going to do now that this book is over is clean my study. Um, so um, people start to talk about declaring independence and local governments start to say, hey, maybe we should declare independence. And states begin to say, or, or colonies begin to say they should declare independence. And finally... Uh, the the Virginia delegates write to um, their delegate to the Second Cont Continental Congress, Lee, and say, you know, why don't you propose this idea that the colonies ought to be independent? So Lee brings that forward on June 7th, 1776. And a lot of delegates to the Second Continental Congress are like, we don't want any part of this. What are you talking about? So 
the the more radical members of the Constitutional Congress say, let's appoint a committee to talk about the three different pieces. There's actually three pieces in the Lee resolution. And, and we don't talk much about the other two because because of the Declaration of Independence. But on, Ju on June 10th, they put together a committee to write a Declaration of Independence in case Lee's resolution actually passes. So on the 7th, Lee introduces it. It gets tabled for a while, or not really tabled, but put aside for a while. And, um, and on the 10th, the Second Continental Congress puts together a team of people to write the declaration. Of course, the person who really rises to the fore on that is Thomas Jefferson. And when he goes to write his declaration, the first draft he does, he takes a lot of his language from the Virginia Declaration, but lots of states have been putting forward their own declarations. So he takes a lot of that language and his first version is really kind of over the top. Um, Thomas Jefferson tends to write it a little bit over the top and they're gonna, they're gonna boil it down down when the Continental Congress actually adopts it. They're going to do some other more important stuff as well. But the Declaration of Independence that we, spe that we, that we celebrate today is a statement of principles for sure, and I'm going to talk about that. But you kind of need to remember that it's two days after they've said they're going to, uh, they do consider themselves independent. Because what the Declaration does is something very specific. It doesn't just say these colonies are going to be independent um, because they've already said that. They said that on the second. So on the fourth, they're going to sign this. Now, here's the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776. And this is how it begins. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Okay, so, so they didn't start by saying we're going to declare independence because they did that already two days ago. What they're saying here in the Declaration is we feel that we need to explain to other countries around the globe why we think it's okay for us essentially to rebel against our governments, which is not something generally that governments like, right? So, so they need to explain what they're doing. So the Declaration of Independence is an explanation to the world of what they are doing. And then we have this, this, this unparalleled phenomenal quotation we hold these truths to be self-evident. Really important language right there. Self-evident. That is, at the time when they are talking about mathematical equations, for example, and, and these uh, uh, founders were uh, um, certainly cognizant of mathematics and of the, the, the ways that mathematical formulas are written, you start with premises that are self-evident. Like these can't be argued with. We hold these things to be self-evident. Okay, so this is like a mathematical equation that is resting on absolute bedrock. The laws of nature and of nature's God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. I'm going to pull that apart in just a minute. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, an awful lot is right there in that line. We hold these truths to be self-evident. This is a mathematical equation. These are self-evident, that all men are created equal. Hang on. Most of the people in that room were either enslavers themselves or part of an economy that got its money from enslavement. So what the heck does it mean that all men are created equal? When in fact, quite literally in their own lives, they're holding people in different ways. They're, they're seeing people in different ways. And, and I just, I'm not gonna talk here a lot about women, but where are women? Because they're, they're not here. Because the framers who, uh, the founders, I'm sorry, the founders are the people who write the, wrote the 
wrote the Declaration. The framers are the ones who wrote the Constitution. The founders just did not believe that women were equal. That I mean, there's just they just that, that was like you know me. For them, that would be. I'm going to exaggerate if I, I won't, I won't, I won't make the comparison I was going to, but it's rather like saying, oh yeah, Martians are human. I mean, they simply did not see women as being anywhere able to be equal to them. So let's get rid of women altogether from this conversation. But what about all men are created equal when they literally enslave people? That's really, I mean, that's, that is, important in every possible way. But that language is important because what it really highlights is behind the ideas of the, the Declaration of Independence is the concept that because the Euro-American men had f it created a system in which indigenous Americans and black Americans um, were unequal, were kept sort of below the line, they were they the founders were able to conceive of the world as in as one in which everybody was equal because they they basically got rid of most of the population so if everybody was white and most people were property and i'll talk about that in a minute that is they own a property it's much easier to say hey we're all equal here you know the differences between the squire over here and the laborer over here both white men who aspire to property if they don't have it themselves they're all pretty much equal we're just not going to not going to put in that equation at all indigenous americans or black americans so that idea right there that all men are created equal was itself very limited at the beginning but this is so important i think and i hope i have time to talk about frederick Douglass. um that concept is expandable and that's really important. There's a lot of people who will, will suggest we should throw out this whole document, throw out this whole concept of American democracy. And people like me say no, just because they couldn't see the implications and because they limited their vision doesn't mean those principles are not good ones, that all people are created equal. All right, so uh, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. An unalienable right is a right that cannot be given away or put away from you. So you can't um, sell to somebody the right to take your life. You can't, uh, you can't have taken from you, again, the right to liberty, which again, they're enslaving African-Americans and Africans in this period. But they assume that there are certain rights that cannot be gotten rid of. And then um, they argue that among those are life, liberty, a huge trip there again with with enslaved um, black and indigenous people and the pursuit of happiness really interesting shift there because the way that that concept was originally articulated was life liberty and property but the the idea that you could say people had the right to hold property um is going to cause real trouble across class lines in in the um in the colonies so they changed that to pursuit of happiness uh, especially since, of course, enslaved people couldn't often own property. All right, so they've changed that up a lot. But then they go on in the next sentence, and I promise I'm not going to go through the entire declaration this slowly, but this beginning is really important. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And that's straight from Thomas Paine. That to secure the rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, we need to have governments. And, and, and Paine calls government a necessary evil. That's where we get that language because he says, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to have a government, but people need that to get along. So we have the necessary evil of government in order to protect life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Because otherwise, you know, some strong man can come in and take all of it, or in their case, a monarch. Um, uh, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And this part is so crucial deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That is, your, your government is not legitimate unless the people who are governed agree to it. And that's, that's American democracy, right? This is one of the things I keep hammering on every time a state takes away the right to vote. You know, it is an illegitimate government unless 
the, the those uh, governed have consented to it. And again, in order to justify that, and and I'm only dealing with the declaration here because understandings of what this means is going to change a lot in the first half of the 19th century when quite literally enslavers are going to say, hey, we have no intention of getting the consent of the governed from any of the people we enslave or from women or from poor white men. So you can put that right out of your heads. We don't believe in the Declaration of Independence. They literally say that. Um, but so they're making this argument here that everybody is equal and everybody has a right to have a say in their government, although they define everybody as white men. Again, those concepts are very expandable. And then they go on um, to, to, to make a, a, a very Jeffersonian case here. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So if, if we're not getting this from our government, we have the right to put it aside. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Okay, if you're, we really shouldn't throw overthrow old governments for, for stupid, uh, transient reasons. Um, and accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. And most people don't like change, so we tend to put up with a lot more than we ought to it says. Um, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So, we tend to put up with a lot, but when our government tends to get um, to be to be affecting our liberties, to be taking away from us the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, it tends to be dictating to us, then it is not only our right, it is our duty to push back against that government. Such has been the patient sufferings of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. We've been really good, but now we finally are, we've had enough, we need to throw this off. The history of the present King of Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. So they're saying, and finally, it's the king. We've had it. The king has repeatedly hurt us, has repeatedly took away our rights, and has uh, tried to establish tyranny over the colonies and states in this case means the governmental states not they are not states of the United States yet because there isn't a United States and there's not going to be one for quite a while yet remember that the constitution is not till still a number of years after the end of the, the revolutionary war to prove this let facts be submitted to a candid world and I'm not going to go through all the um, the acts that they list because they do, you know, each act is a response to something directly that the colonists complained about with the the, the king and with his ministers. Um, and they're a little bit in the weeds. So, for example, he has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, it's a little bit complicated for uh, almost six o'clock my time on 4th of July. But there's a list here. Um, so you got the introduction that says, here's what we're doing and here's why. And here's the principle behind this. And then now there's a long list of complaints about the king, the king himself, what the king has done. Um, and uh, that's what this whole long list is. So if you've ever heard the thing the thing read out loud, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on here? What's going on here? There's, you know, he's deprived us of the benefits of trial by jury. He has transported us beyond the seas to be tried for pretended offenses. He has abolished the free English system of laws. I mean, on and on and on like that. So you've got three sections. You've got the first part, you've got the, the, the complaints. And, and it is really worth pointing out here that one of the complaints that gets removed when the Congress talks about this is that he has established enslavement in the colonies. 
And this, of course, is going to be because in order to get this sucker through the Constitutional, I'm sorry, through the, uh, the Second Continental Congress, they've got to bring the Southern enslavers on board. And they're like, we're not going to complain about enslavement. We're quite happy with enslavement down here. Many people call that America's original sin. Um, and yet this is the problem with politics, right? That if they had not come on board, the revolution never would have worked. So this was a compromise that they affected and then my guess is pretended would be okay because they had, the Eli Whitney had not yet invented the cotton gin which is going to happen in the 1790s and a lot of people until then could argue that enslavement as an economic system was going to fall apart and they did argue that but of course once we got the the cotton gin um, all bets were off. And the same thing about the Constitution. The Constitution is written right before the invention of the cotton gin, which changes the entire economy by making cotton so incredibly valuable. But it's really important that that too is right here in this declaration. And here's the, 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 the next piece though, in this, the third section of the declaration says, every time he's done this, we tried to reason with him. We tried to, to find common ground. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. His fault, not our fault. We're good, he's bad. We've tried and tried and tried to get along with him and he keeps pushing us to the wall again and again and again. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. You know, we, we reached out to you folks. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. Hey, listen, we tried. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity, that is, uh, blood ties. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind enemies in war, in peace, friends. So they're not just divorcing the king, they're divorcing the English people as well, saying, you, you did this to us. You should have fought for us. You should have pushed back along with us, and you didn't, so we're going it alone. Now here's the final paragraph. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, not capital yet, United is, is, a, is an adjective here, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, in the name of the people that are doing this, not in the name of the delegates or the states or anything else, they're doing it in the name of the people, and do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare Okay, so here's what's coming from January, from uh, July 2nd. They do solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war conduct peace contract alliances establish commerce and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do huge deal right there so here we've got the principles which again they, they don't live up to those principles yet it's a very limited vision uh, uh, for, or it's a very limited enactment, but the vision, the idea that people can be equal and they have a right to this, this to have a say in their government is still mind blowing. If you think about it, look at the world around us, look at, look at Belarus, look at Russia, look at uh, 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 Hungary, 
Look at people in the United States who want to get rid of our right to consent to our government. This is the age old fight between whether we should have kings, strong men, authoritarians, or whether we really can trust individuals to have a say in their government. And that doesn't mean we agree with them all the time. And it doesn't mean we always make good decisions. And it, it doesn't mean that we win every election we want to win. But it means we trust in the basic equality of human beings to say that one person's voice is as important as somebody else's. And even though the founders couldn't see that themselves, and a lot of people still don't see it entirely themselves, that to me is a principle that we really do have to believe is self-evident. It's not always going to be self-evident in our history. Uh, it's not self-evident now to a lot of people, but it's something, that concept that, that equality and the right to have a say in our government are self-evident propositions seems to me to be ones that are in fact willing to put on the line and, and to put, put my weight anyway behind. And listen to what they said about it. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. By writing their names at the bottom of that document, and you all know the story about John Hancock writing, it, at least I think it's apocryphally, in huge letters saying there, I'm sure George III can read that. Um, that was very typical Hancock. He was quite flamboyant and, you know, kind of a fancy clothes, kind of outspoken, wealthy man. Um, but by signing that declaration, all these people who put their names at the bottom of this declaration, they were literally putting their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the line. Because if the Revolutionary War, the, the, the revolution itself was they considered to be in the minds of the people. It was in people's minds, the revolution. The Revolutionary War is what made everybody agree to it. Um, uh, other countries agree to it. But the revolution in people's minds was in this document. And by putting their names at the bottom of it, if the Revolutionary War didn't go well, these men were traitors. And they would, in fact, lose their lives. And they would, in fact, lose their fortunes. And their names would have gone down in history as traitors. They would have lost their sacred honor. But they, they did it because they believed in it. And for all the limitations of their visions, and for all of the trouble that those limitations has given us since, for all the struggle, for all the death in our country, because people still thought about who was included in equality and who was excluded from equality, for all the trouble we're looking at today as people are still fighting about that same set of principles, it is still, to me anyway, an astonishing declaration to be willing to take on a world power by these these men on in these in these little colonies to say no as human beings we have the right to equality and we have the right to have a say in our government and that seems to me to be absolutely worth celebrating uh, I'm going to go down to do what 21st century Americans do, which is to hang out with my family and eat watermelon salad. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful 4th of July, and I'm picking up the reins again tomorrow. We'll be doing history and politics again um, and taking on the rest of the summer because, boy, I think we're going to have quite a ride to November 2024. But I'm really, really proud to be part of this community. And thank you uh, for being here with me. I'll see you tomorrow.